the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I hope by now that uh, life is getting back to normal for you. I know many of you lost power and some for several days or more. And some lost uh, water. There, we've had the power outages and loss of water pressure here in the Houston area. And we know that's affected many in our congregation. And I appreciate the way the elders um, tried to make sure to check up on everyone. And if, uh, if there's anyone that still has a need, again, let me just reiterate that. To please uh, let us know. We want to be able to minister to those who, who might need our help. But we hope uh, by now things are, are back to normal for most all of us, for all of us really. And also, let me take this moment. I know I did this at some length in my Wednesday night class, which, which um, is recorded and then uploaded to YouTube, and it's still accessible if you're interested in looking at that. But, but once again, please indulge me. We want to thank you for your sympathy. We want to thank you for all your kind expressions of love and concern, especially for your prayers on behalf of our family in the loss of our little grandson, Everett. Um, as you can imagine, our daughter and son-in-law, Jacob, are still struggling in their, in their grief. We're going to go over there this afternoon and stay with them a few days more and try to take some uh, burdens off of them and allow them a little uh, time to, to relax. And we're glad that we got to spend some time with them already. We were very blessed to be able to rush over there. And in fact, uh, that's one of the reasons the, when, the, when the job offer came to us to come here and be with you, that was something that was important to us to be near our family. And this turned out, perhaps the Lord knew. This was a time where we were going to be needed to be close by so that we could rush over there uh, at a time of uh, great need and great loss. But thank you so much, and we know the grace of God <clears throat> will sustain our daughter and Jacob and their family, and please continue to, to pray for them. We appreciate that more than, more than you know. What a blessing, isn't it, to have brothers and sisters in Christ that we know care about us and who pray for us and that we can lean on when we all experience these, uh, experience these losses in our, in our lives. And then let me just mention, too, uh, what's a great success. I know that's a cliche. You, you see that all the time. Something could be a total disaster, but the church bulletin would say, hey, our VBS was a great success, whatever. You always hear great success, great, this was a great success, but really the event yesterday, if you didn't get to take part in it, it was a great success. It really went uh, amazingly well, and we appreciate so much all of those. I'm afraid to name a couple of people and then leave off some, but I know I know uh, there's one that I want to mention, though, that Edna did a lot of the, the planning and the create, she's the creative force behind the, the, the initial plan. And I know she and the office and John and Amy and some others, uh, and now here I am trying to name some people, and I know I'm leaving some off. But there was a lot of people, because of what happened with the power and water, too, there was a lot that had to be done to make sure everything was ready. But finally, we were able to have that visitation uh, work after having to postpone it a couple of weeks and it was really a good time lots of people came back and stayed and um, huddled uh, around each other in their in the backs of their vehicles and then watched the the movie together and it was a, there was food and all of that stuff it all just went great in fact I told the elder the elders it it went so well, I think we, we're going to move the popcorn concession into the lobby here, and like during the sermon, um, you can feel free to uh, get some refreshments and all that. So we had all of that out there, and it went so well. Um, we, and I, but, but above all, it did great good for us to get to, I saw some of you I haven't been able to see and converse with in a long time, and, and it did great good to go see so many shut-ins who 
appreciated so much getting to see some faces from members of the congregation. Some had not seen anyone since the whole COVID thing started and we had the, uh, some of the quarantine and shutdown and all of that going on. So what a great blessing it was. Thank you for letting me say a few things about those matters for, for just a couple of minutes. We were just singing a few moments ago about the old rugged cross and we, we sing on a hill far away. Well, if you had been there all of those years ago on that fateful Friday, standing outside of the city of Jerusalem and looking over to the top of that hill, you would have seen the spectacle, the disturbing sight of Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, the sinless Son of God, dying in shame and in agony for our sins. This is Rembrandt's etching, famous etching of the three crosses, the crucifixion of Christ. And if you look at the drawing, you see that, of course, Christ, the light is highlighting Jesus on the cross. But it, we look closely and we see that there were two others there crucified with him, right? Right? We know Jesus didn't die alone, adding to the many indignities that he suffered. He was crucified as a criminal, a common criminal between two thieves. And so we often think of the three crosses on the hill of Calvary. And when we think about Jesus dying on the cross and those two who died with him, we, you remember there are seven sayings in the Gospels that Jesus uttered from the cross. And if we think of them as to the way they're recorded in the different Gospels, Matthew and Mark tell us Jesus said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Luke tells us Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Into thy hands I commit my spirit, the old English. Into your hands I commit my spirit. That's also in Luke. In John, Jesus says to his mother, woman, behold your son. And to John, behold your mother. That counts as one saying. And then he also said, I thirst. And in John, he also said, it is finished. But in Luke, there's another statement Jesus made that we're going to look at for a few moments here, when he said to one of those men who were crucified with him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now let's think about that for a few moments here. All of the biographies of Christ record the crucifixion, but only Luke tells us about this exchange that Jesus had with one of the men who were crucified with him. So when we go to Luke's account, in Luke 23, 33, the text tells us that when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. So to add to the drama of the scene, there is Christ in the middle. But Matthew tells us at first both of these men were railing on Christ both of these men were told were joining in with the crowd as they were mocking and belittling Christ. But apparently one of them came to his senses. So as we read on in Luke 23, in verses 39 through 43, one of the criminals, and this again is only in Luke, who were hanged railed at him saying, well, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Ah, but the other, this is what I was referring to, the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God seeing you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And that's when Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. 
This passage came to my mind a number of times as we were going through the grieving process with our daughter and her husband, and, and we thought about how our precious little one was safe with the Lord in paradise. And so I thought this was so much on my heart and was so overwhelming my thinking for so long in the days uh, over the past you know, couple of weeks that I wanted to address this and preach on it and think about it with you for a few minutes. And we're going to use the title of the famous John Milton epic poem. First, of course, was Paradise Lost, but then Milton wrote Paradise Regained. That's the title for the lesson. I know we're 11 minutes in, so let me move along here, but you know you still need to write that down if you're taking notes. Put it there at the top of the page. Paradise Regained, and here's how we're going to approach this. We're, we're viewing it all from the viewpoint of that penitent robber Sometimes he's called the forgiven thief or the good thief because he's the one who turned to the Lord and asked for mercy and received it. But we're going to view it from his perspective. I want to spend most of our time looking at what he recognized, what he recognized, what we can learn from his statement to Jesus, and what, in fact, what we learn from what he said to the other who was crucified along with them. And what he said to Jesus. So what he recognized. And then we'll look at what he received from Jesus at the end of our lesson. So first of all, what what did he recognize? What can we say about this? First of all, what he recognized was that Jesus is Lord and King. And let me suggest to you here, he may have had at that moment he may have had a greater understanding, on a certain level, a greater understanding of Christ and his kingdom than Jesus' own disciples did. This is one of the many of the tremendous ironies surrounding the crucifixion of Christ. That he seems to know more about the kingdom than even his own disciples did. What did he say? Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. Now, what's incredible about that is he said that to a dying man. He said it to a man who was hanging in agony next to him, dying just as he was, and he says, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And it shows us, first of all, that he, re- he acknowledged Jesus in some sense as Lord, Lord, remember me, and somehow he's anticipating that Jesus is going to have a kingdom. So he's either stopped to consider what these people are saying about him as they castigate him, as they belittle him. Uh, Perhaps he's hearing the claims that people are making about him. Perhaps he was familiar with the ministry of Jesus and had heard things about him. We don't know. And Luke doesn't fill all of that in to satisfy our curiosity, but somehow he knows, despite the fact that he's dying, he is going to have a kingdom. He's going to be king, so he's recognizing Jesus as having a kingdom. You remember later at the end of Luke when Jesus is walking with the two, after Jesus' resurrection, he's walking with two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Remember the famous encounter on the road to Emmaus. And you remember, it's fascinating because they don't know they're talking to Jesus. But while they're talking to him, Jesus asks them about their sorrow, and they, they're talking about Jesus, not knowing they're talking to Jesus, and about how, um, how he was crucified, and they say to him, and we had hoped, past tense, hoped, verse 41, that he should redeem Israel. So in other words, when Christ died on the cross, all their hopes were dashed. They're speaking of hope in the past tense. And this man, this man is viewing something that apparently the disciples thought. I mean, it's, uh, for, or forgot, rather. It's, it's hard for us to imagine how broken and how crushed the hopes of the disciples were. And yet this man apparently has in view something they missed, the resurrection 
that Jesus, despite the fact that he's going to die, he is going to live again, and he is going to reign as a king. And he begs Jesus to remember him when he comes in his kingdom. So he recognized that much, and then he recognized his problem. Now notice what he says to the other one who was hanged with him. I'm not going to uh, put the text back up again, but if you want to turn to it, Luke 23, 39 through, through 43. But he says uh, to the others, apparently again at first he was, he was saying similar things to Jesus as the other man. And finally he says, because you know, this is a long drawn out, drawn out ordeal. And so at some point he finally says to the other one, he, re he rebukes his friend and says, don't you fear God seeing we are under the same condemnation? And we're going to come to that next statement in a moment. He says, and we indeed justly. So in other words, he's saying, you know, we deserve what's happening to us. Don't you fear God even at this point when you're about to die and face God? Don't you even now fear God? The reason they are in the situation they're in. The text says they were robbers. We call them the, the thieves, we call him the thief on the cross. The term is robber in one of the Gospels. It's a stronger term, to, to, not just to take by stealth where you might go into someone's house when they're not home and take what belongs to them, but it suggests more the idea of violence, actually overcoming a person and stealing from them. This is, this is what they had done, and he's saying, look, we're here. We deserve what's happening to us. Not, not, that, not that anyone deserves to be tortured to death by civil authorities. That is, that is not what we're saying is just about what is happening here. But he understands they're reaping what they sow. They, they had sinned. But notice what he says about Jesus. This man has done nothing amiss. So uh, I should have mentioned that as well. When he recognizes Jesus as Lord and King, he realizes Jesus is dying as an innocent man. And that's a theme emphasized, especially in Luke's gospel in our class, Introduction to the Gospels, when we were going through Luke. We highlighted the fact that Luke wants to keep pointing out how other people recognize Jesus' innocence. And that's one of the ways I think he's convincing the reader to see that, look, we're not just claiming he was innocent, but even people who were around Jesus recognized that he was innocent. So he's saying, look, we're receiving the due reward for our deeds. So he's acknowledging his own sin. Now, we were talking about this in, in Bible class because we got to Romans 1 where after Paul talks about the gospel being God's power to salvation, he, he starts with the answer. Then he gets to the problem to which the gospel is the answer. Then he talks about the wrath of God beginning in Romans 1.18. How we're under the wrath of God because of sin. And so we, do, we are not going to see our need for the gospel until we recognize the magnitude of our own sin. And, and not just the fact that we've sinned, because I suppose everyone recognizes, you know, people say, well, no one's perfect. We, sure, we've all sinned. But th the problem is people don't recognize the magnitude of their sin, the consequences of their sin, that in sinning, they have violated the person of a holy God. And because of that, they're under the wrath and under the condemnation of God. In other words, sin is not just some abstractness or some sickness. Sin is a matter of my will and sin is a matter of violating the person, the very person of God. It is a personal offense against God. I have to realize that, or I'm never going to see my need for the gospel. So we were talked about that in the last Bible class on Romans 1, and we overlapped that today, talking about what the wrath of God really is. And if you want to access the class, I encourage you to do that. But Paul will later go on to say in Romans 3.23, we've all sinned. Okay, but you have to go further than that. He says we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's the problem with my sin. Is God in his holiness and his glory cannot 
overlook my sin. He cannot be indifferent to my sin. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. We have to come to grips with the terrible consequences of our sin or we're never going to see our need for Jesus. We have to realize we're naked and undone. And no wonder it seems so few people are really interested in the gospel in our day, in our culture, compared to previous generations. People do not see that they are under the wrath of a holy God and they need to respond to Christ or they are going to suffer separation from God forever in hell. This man, apparently, the fact that he was about to die, sobered up. And recognize this. And in fear, he said, don't you fear God even now? Don't you fear God? In fear, he is coming to grips with his own sin and his need for Jesus. But then notice also this man, and this is where we have to, we have to understand this as well or we won't see the need for the gospel. Is that he sees the need for justice. He says, now look, to the other man, we receive, we're receiving the due reward for our deeds. Again, not that being a robber, that the just punishment for that is crucifixion. No, no one ought to be crucified. No one ought to be tortured to death because of a crime that they've committed. But, but he understands, look, our condemnation is just in the sense that we have violated the law and we're now being punished. And so violation of the law requires punishment justice justice God's justice demands that I be punished for my sin see that's something that is totally lost on our culture that has lost the sense of personal accountability we, we live in a time where personal responsibility is greatly undermined by a victimist mentality that, that I'm not responsible for the choices I've made. It's the fault of uh, our, our ancestors. It's the fault of our environment. It's the fault of our genetics. It's the fault of what somebody else did to me years ago. Or it's, it's always someone else's fault. And so people look for a way to sort of mitigate their responsibility. And the problem we have, like even in our criminal justice system, is, is we've come to think of, of, of prison and uh, punishment as not punishment per se, but as rehabilitation. Now, I do agree that it's good to give opportunity when we, people commit certain crimes. It's good to give opportunity uh, for rehabilitation. But people think of punishment as just rehabilitative and so sometimes you'll hear people say well we just need to give people time and so that they can learn to make better choices they can just be a better person and so because of that mentality that your problem isn't really sin and evil choices that you've made it's a sickness and you just need time to heal and that's why we've seen in western cultures such a radical change in the length of sentences for grievous crimes and sometimes you hear about people committing heinous acts and you hear about them only maybe doing a few years in prison and you're thinking how does a judge allow that how does a jury settle on that it's because of this idea this loss of the sense of accountability and that prison is not primarily about rehabilitation. It's about retribution. It's about punishment. Sometimes we'll hear people say, for example, you'll hear that a jury could not, uh, does not give the death penalty in the case of first-degree murder. I agree there could be mitigating circumstances in some cases of murder where we might not give the death penalty. But generally speaking, the failure to execute those who commit murder, according to Scripture, is an injustice. I believe the Bible teaches that. I'd be happy to show you that. But sometimes you hear juries say, well, we didn't give the death penalty because, you know, after all, it won't bring the victim back. Or sometimes you'll even hear the victim's family say, well, we're opposed to the death penalty because it's not going to bring our dear loved one back. Listen, 
the death penalty is necessary for justice. It's a matter of justice. It's a matter of what a person deserves, punishment for what they've done. But we've lost that, and that's why people don't really think of the reality of hell. They don't, I, they don't realize, you know, hell is what I deserve because of my sin. And that's the reason that we need the cross. Paul says in Romans 3, 23 through 26, that Jesus had to bear the punishment as a propitiation for our sins so that God could be just and the justifier of those who have faith in Jesus so that he could be a just God and not condemn me for my sin. That's the whole point of the cross. So he recognized the need for justice, and then, of course, he recognized his need for Jesus. For Jesus. So he makes an appeal to Jesus. And what do people do with their guilt? What do people do when they're struggling with the consequences of their sin? So many people in our culture are being eaten alive by the weight of their own guilt. And they try to bury it with drugs, with alcohol, in relationships, in, in, in excessive behavior, people in, in therapy. And not that therapy is bad, not that counseling is bad, but people, so, so many people are trying to find so many ways to deal with their guilt. And what, what our greatest need is, is for forgiveness. To know that because of what Jesus did on my behalf, my guilt is, is lifted and my burden can be gone if I respond to him as he has appointed. And that I can be set right with the Lord. And so we'll see. That's what Jesus promises. So, as I said, I, I purposely said earlier, then at the end of our lesson, we'll look at what he received so you wouldn't panic when we just now get to this other point. But this is really now we're seeing how Jesus responds to him. What, that's what he recognized about himself and about God and about Jesus. And that's what we all need to recognize. But now, what did he receive? Well, acceptance. That's what we're craving. That's what, deep down inside, that's what we desperately need to know. That we can be accepted by God. That we, despite what we've done wrong, and that we deserve, we justly are under God's wrath to know that though I can be accepted by Him, that I can be forgiven by Him. That's what He receives. Now, that's, that's what He recognized he needed, and that's essentially, that's what Jesus gave him when he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Because the only way he could be with the Holy Lord beyond this life is if he received that forgiveness. Let me read to you this little poem that was written by an elementary school teacher, but I think it expresses it beautifully. She came to my desk with a quivering lip. The lesson was done. Have you a new sheet for me, dear teacher? I've spoiled this one. I took his sheet all spoiled and blotted, gave him a new one all unspotted, and into his tired heart I cried, Do better now, my child. I went to the throne with a trembling heart. The day was done. Have you a new day for me, dear master? I've spoiled this one. He took my day all soiled and blotted, and gave me a new one, all unspotted. And into my tired heart he cried, Do better now, my child. That's, that's what we so desperately need that Jesus can give to us. A new start, a new life, a new beginning. What that man received that day was the hope that we all so desperately need, that we long for deep within our hearts he said to the man today you'll be with me in paradise not heaven and so i think if we take the whole of the bible's teaching this is 
the, what we would call the intermediate state where the righteous dead, where the spirits of the righteous dead are awaiting the resurrection when we'll be reunited with our bodies, transformed into immortal bodies to dwell with the Lord forever in what the Bible calls the new heavens and new earth and that we call heaven. Paradise. To be with the Lord in paradise. That's what we lost in the beginning because of sin, but that we can have again in Christ. And notice what he said. Notice what he said. You'll be with me in paradise. It's not just that I want to live on after I die. I want to be with Jesus after I die. Today you'll be with me in paradise. You know, when people go through such terrible losses in their lives, how do, they, how do they cope without the hope of the gospel? We wonder that, don't we? We say that to each other all of the time because we're always comforting each other when we lose a loved one. We remind ourselves of the hope of eternal life that we have in Christ when we lose a righteous loved one who's died in the Lord. But what, what about the view without God in the picture? What about the secular view? What, what, is, what is life? You just get old, you get sick, and then you die, and that's all there is. And there's no reunion, there's no hope of ever being with the righteous loved ones again. There's nothing. Let me read to you before we offer the invitation. This powerful poem, I posted it after we lost our little grandson. And when I first heard this, it touched my heart, and I hope it'll touch your heart. It's, it was written in 1798 by William Wordsworth. Uh, a friend, uh, Wordsworth was a friend of Bernard, of course. And he wrote this beautiful poem in 1798. We are seven. A simple child, this little one, that lightly draws its breath and feels its life in every limb, what should she know of death? I met a little cottage girl. She was eight years old, she said. Her hair was thick with many a curl that clustered round her head. She had a rustic woodland air, and she was wildly clad. Her eyes were fair and very fair. Her beauty made me glad. Sisters and brothers, little maid, how many may you be? How many? Seven in all, she said, and wondering looked at me. And where are they, I pray you tell? She answered, seven are we. Two of us at Conway dwell, and two are gone to sea. And two of us in the churchyard lie, my sister and my brother. And in the churchyard cottage I dwell near them with my mother. You say that two at Conway dwell, and two are gone to sea. Yet ye are seven, I pray you tell, sweet maid, how this can be. Then did the little maid reply, seven boys and girls are we. Two of us in the churchyard lie beneath the churchyard tree. Now you run about, my little maid, your limbs they are alive. If two are in the churchyard laid, then ye are only five. Their graves are green, they may be seen, the little maid replied, twelve steps or more from my mother's door, and they are side by side. And my stockings, there I often knit, and my kerchief, there I hem, and there upon the ground I sit and sing a song to them. And often after sunset, sir, when it is light and fair, I may take my little porringer and eat my supper there. The first that died was Sister Jane in bed. She moaning lay till God released her of her pain and then she went away. So in the churchyard she was laid and when the grass was dry, together round her grave we played, my brother John and I. And when the ground was white with snow and I could run and slide, my brother John was forced to go, and he lies by her side. 
How many are you then, said I, if they too are in heaven? Quick was the little maid's reply, O oh, master, we are seven. But they are dead, those two are dead. Their spirits are in heaven. Twas throwing words away for still, the little maid would have her will and said, Nay, we are seven. And that little girl recognized that death is not the end. And if, if we'll surrender to Jesus, then we will be with him in paradise and with those who've gone to paradise. And like he rose triumphant on that Sunday morning, then we have the promise of rising again as well to eternal life. Oh, death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have victory over death through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so, what a, a profound moment when the Lord uttered those words to that man and changed his eternal destiny in that moment. Oh, what about you? Jesus extends the same hope of forgiveness, uh, of acceptance, of eternal life to you. But now, don't take from this account that, well... Here we have an assurance that I can just wait till my deathbed and then I'll just cry out to the Lord and he'll save me. You know, when we usually talk about the thief on the cross is when we're talking about baptism. Because so often we hear in the churches of Christ when we're trying to talk to our religious friends about the, that, a bap, that baptism is essential to salvation, we hear people say, well, what about the thief on the cross? We'll, we'll address that perhaps in another lesson. But it's a shame that often that's the only time we ever study this text because there's so much more here to think about. But what happened after the Jesus rose from the dead is he sent out his disciples. Now, he forgave that man that day as he did to others on occasion personally. But then when he sent out his inspired ambassadors, the apostles with the Holy Spirit, to preach the good news, and when people heard it and they believed, like that man did, that Jesus was Lord, that he was Messiah, that he was King, then they were told, they weren't told, well, just cry out to the Lord and, and ask him to, to, to save you, and he'll say, you're forgiven, you'll be with me in paradise. No, they were told to repent and be baptized, every, every one of you, Peter said, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible tells us we need to do to respond, to reach out to Christ and to say to him essentially, Lord, remember me when you come. And that's how the Lord offers us what he gave to the thief that day. And if we can help you have that assurance, you can die with the same hope that Jesus gave to that man that day. He wants to give it to you. And we want to help you to secure it. And we want that hope, dear brother or sister, to comfort your heart. Whatever struggles, whatever loss you're going through, I hope that we'll remember. In just a little while, hold on, and we're going to be with Jesus. Let's stand and let's sing this song together.